I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here in my chair of infinite knowledge and answer your questions about the Second World War. And remember, if you desperately want me to answer your specific question, then you should definitely join the Time Ghost Army. Well, partly because it's cool, and also because your questions will get priority. Okay, my first question today comes from Time Ghost Army Specialist Isaac Harris Hessel Robinson. Okay. Got a question for Out of the Foxholes. If Japan had invaded the Dutch East Indies without declaring war on anyone else, would the U.S. and or U.K. have gotten involved? Japan obviously thought they would, but it seems unlikely that after all that's already happened, an invasion of another European colony would change America's minds about going to war. Well, as you might have seen in our special episode on the Japanese desire to create an empire with a self-sufficient eternal economy, that the Dutch East Indies was an A-level prize for the Japanese. It has many natural resources that Japan does not, like, well, like petroleum, which Japan almost wholly depended on trade with America for, and which embargo cut off in 1941. Now, the Japanese didn't really want war with Britain or America per se. They just wanted their Southeast Asian Empire, right? Which was a whole lot more places than just the Dutch East Indies. But as you say, uh, the Japanese expected the British and Americans wouldn't allow Japan to just take the land and resources of the Dutch colony, so they attacked Pearl Harbor and the Philippines and all that as a preemptive strike to, like, we've gone over this a million times. So, what if Japan were to just mosey on down to the Dutch East Indies, politely smiling and waving at the British and Americans, hi, hi, no, no, just, we're leaving you guys alone, we're not gonna do anything. Were they right to fear military repercussions? Well, as I've said before, what ifs are by nature impossible to answer. You cannot know for a fact what people would have done if things were different. And also, once again, and very importantly here again, history does not happen in a vacuum. But I'll backtrack, we'll start with Britain. 1941, the British being the last remaining free European country to continue the fight against the Germans, are in no shape to fight another military superpower on the other side of the globe. All resources and manpower are already being put to work in Europe and North Africa, and even that might not be enough. You know, you have to keep watching this channel to find out. For the British to get involved, American participation sort of has to be guaranteed, but that can't be taken for granted. Um, British ambassador to Tokyo, Sir Robert Craigie, writes in November 1941, Our interests and those of the U.S. in the Far East, while very similar, have never been identical. In particular, I doubt whether the U.S. government can be expected to work with any enthusiasm for the defense of our interests and position in the Far East, except insofar as these contribute directly to the defense and security of the United States. And that is the thing. Sure, President Roosevelt promises the British ambassador that we should all be in this together, that they could count on armed support from the U.S., but it's not up to Roosevelt to declare war on a foreign power, it's up to Congress. And since Congress extended the 1940 peacetime draft bill by just one vote in August 1941, declaring war just to save the Dutch East Indies a few months later may seem far-fetched. I mean, if the British are unsure if the Americans care about the interests of their number one ally, imagine how the Dutch must feel. The European Netherlands is occupied by the Germans anyhow, and the Dutch army in the East Indies cannot take on the Japanese alone. So in that very specific scenario, you can maybe assume that while Roosevelt might try to persuade his fellow Americans to step in and declare war on the Japanese, they might not go for it. However, as I said, history doesn't happen in a vacuum. And it is not just oil that Japan needs and wants. They very much need rubber, for example, and a whole lot of other resources that are also very much affected by the American embargo. So they're never going to just visit the Dutch East Indies and no one else, like Malaya. And the US needs more rubber than basically anyone on Earth for the huge American automotive industry and gets most of it from Malaya. The Japanese want the Malayan resources really badly, and I cannot see them not attacking it. Should the Japanese attack Malaya, which has, you know, lots of other resources they need, would the U.S. then fight the Japanese, not just as Britain's ally, but to save the domestic automotive industry from shortages, rationing, and huge cost increases? Okay, that's my question, question for you, who, uh, Isaac, who wrote this uh, question. 
whichever one of your names is the one you actually use. And don't say the Japanese could, you know, sell the U.S. the rubber because the U.S. then would have to lift the embargo against Japan for that to happen. And what would that mean? And you see how stupidly complicated this gets when you try a what if. They're not isolated, separate things. They're not. I mean, who can possibly guess what would happen? Uh, let's see. Uh, Time Ghost Private Eli Kanam writes, uh, he asks, what was life in Cyprus like during the war? Did Britain use the island as a strategic base like Malta? And did the Greek and Turkish Cypriots have differing views of getting involved? Before the war broke out, the situation in Cyprus was, it was pretty tense. Um, the 1930s there were characterized by a repressive rule under British colonial supervisor Sir Richard Palmer. There was no government representation of Greek and Turk Cypriots and political influence, whether regional, local, it was limited as much as possible. And those years also see a lot of civil unrests and many protests and revolts from Greek Cypriots wanting to unite with Greece. Things, yeah, they're looking to get a little better when Sir William Bettershill, uh, who is popular with Cypriots and the British colonial office, takes over just before Cyprus enters the war allied with Britain as a colony in September 1939. The Cyprus Regiment is founded in which Greek and Turkish Cypriots, among others, fight for the Allies. Some end up fighting alongside the British at Dunkirk. But in general, enthusiasm for the British war effort is hard to find and few people enlist. That changes when Greece is invaded by Italy in 1940. And by 1941, thousands of Cypriots fight shoulder to shoulder with the Greeks and the British during the German invasion. So um, here in 1942, um, you know, but with the German occupation of Greece and Crete, Cyprus is, strategically speaking, of big importance to the Allies. If the Germans were to control the island, that would present them with a good jumping off point to attack Egypt. The British uh, Special Operations Executive, the SOE, actually are planning, they have plans to wage a guerrilla war in case of an occupation. Anything to keep the Germans from further threatening the Allied position in North Africa. Uh, now here's the spoilers. When that invasion doesn't come, relative calm returns to Cyprus. In fact, Cyprus slowly grows into a haven for people like refugees from occupied Southern Europe. When the Allies again regain the offensive initiative, Cyprus will also become a base from which they can launch attacks on occupied Greece. However, here in 1942, Cyprus is still somewhat of a beleaguered fortress. Supply lines are constantly under the threat of German and Italian planes, warships, and submarines. Colonial supervisor Battershill, Battershill excuse me, has anticipated this and made the island as self-sufficient as possible, converting the unexportable surplus of grapes into raisin bread and transform, transforming the Nicosia dump into a compost reserve. Regardless of this though, the long economic blockade does cause inflation and food shortages, which lead to riots, you know, near the end of the war. Okay, Riov 26, who is a Time Ghost Army member with the esteemed rank of Captain, woohoo, asks, during the Second Sino-Japanese War, what specialized units, elite formations, or special forces, if any, did the Chinese nationalist and communist forces develop and use in their fight against Japan's military? That is an interesting question. We've seen, you know, how many countries come up with different ways to train and deploy their troops. You know, parachutists, commandos, and marines. So yeah, it's only fair to ask what the Chinese National Army and the Chinese Communist Army came up with to outdo each other and the Japanese. And the answer to your question is simple enough. Neither of them really had any. Let's start with Mao Zedong's People's Liberation Army. This army is very much a peasant army. Its soldiers are generally very poorly educated and poorly equipped. They don't have extensive training or heavy equipment. And because of this, the communist military primarily employs fairly unsophisticated guerrilla warfare tactics. To Mao, that is a strength rather than a weakness. He does not need fancy training or complicated tactics or high-tech equipment because he has the numbers. Uh, in 1938, he wrote that the richest source of power to wage war lies in the masses of the people. So instead of elite troops, it's popular support that allows him to sustain his military campaign, to grow his army, and to deny his enemies effective use of the lands and villages. The Kuomintang and its National Revolutionary Army under 
Chiang Kai-shek, they aren't really able to get something remarkable off the ground either. Like the PLA, the NRA is characterized by large numbers with inadequate training and lacking equipment. That doesn't mean there are not any Chinese un units that would not deserve the label elite, of course. There are some that stand out for various reasons. Let's see, the 3rd, 6th, 9th, 14th, 36th, 87th, and 88th Army Divisions. Those are considered the most elite at Chang's disposal. Now, those seven divisions were reorganized and trained by Nazi German advisors before 1937. And they used modern tactics, they used German weapons and equipment, they wore the Stahlhelm. And uh, speaking of the 36th Division, um, a cavalry and infantry unit consisting almost entirely of Muslim soldiers. Now, they were drilled by their Muslim general, Ma Zhongying, who exposed them to harsh climates, daily maneuvers, sword fights, man-to-man -man combat, and heavy physical exercise to mold them into his own elite army. And they successfully halt the Soviet incursion in China in 1934, and then they're reorganized into one of those German-trained infantry units I mentioned. Um, well, that's it for today. Thank you very much, Chair. That was some great stuff. Uh, more answers for all to see and enjoy free of charge. If you want to watch that episode about the Japanese economic war aims I mentioned in the first, first question, you can click right here for that. And if you have a burning question for anything related to World War II, do not ask it here, okay? You can submit it at community.timeghost.tv. Well, you can ask it here, but I'm not gonna answer it. We'll just bleep over it. And poor Frankie will have to bleep over it. And we, you know, we've said before, we don't wanna dump more work on Frankie's shoulders, right? Put another picture of Frankie in here, right? But I'm Frankie looking sad if we have one. See, this is Frankie happy. This is Frankie sad. Don't make Frankie sad. Uh, Community.timeghost.tv. That's where you ask. If you want priority answers, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. That's the way. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. <laughs>